everyone. Welcome to episode 135. I uh, am so pleased that you could be here today. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being here. <clears throat> I'm glad that uh, Suzanne and Christina, that you guys were able to be here. I know you guys, we uh, were chatting about times. It's so good to see everybody. Hi, Eve and Florence and Karma and Kelly. It's so good to see you guys. Um, today's show, we've got um, some 51 Yarns projects to share. And we've got, um, I don't think we have any breeding color studies. I don't think I pulled any of that out today. But um, I wanted to share, yeah, we've got some stuff to share from the community. And then I've got some finished yarn, which is sitting right here to share with you guys. I actually was just, I just skeined this up. So it hasn't been washed. I, I literally just pulled it off my skein winder. So that's really fun that um, I was able to uh, share that with you guys today. And, um, and then we've got an unboxing. So it's a little bit different this week. Um, the show is a little bit, a little bit out of the ordinary because we have a big unboxing to do. We don't do unboxings very often. I think we've only ever done one other one in the time of the podcast, so that's really fun. And um, yeah, it's just so good for you guys to be here. So welcome, and let's get into the show. All right, so I was just actually looking really quickly for uh, something that I seem to have misplaced, which is unusual for me because I had everything all queued up for today, but I actually went to bed early last night because I had a really, really horrible headache and um, I just really didn't feel great. And I'm not really sure what was going on. Yesterday was an incredibly busy day and there was a couple of things that happened that just kind of threw off my groove, which I know sounds kind of funny to say, but it just was kind of like, it was a really good day on one hand. And then on the other hand, it was like, not a good day, you know? And so by the time Mike came home late and I just looked at him and I was like, I have the worst headache. And I didn't feel, I, I felt like I wasn't sick, but I just had a really terrible headache. And I was like, I just need some quiet time. Like I just literally need to like extricate myself from life for a few minutes. So I actually felt this morning because because I did that, um, I just sat and read and had some quiet time and whatnot, and then eventually you know went to bed. I um, I felt really off this morning because stuff wasn't done and I hadn't had an opportunity to kind of get things get things sorted. So I'm sorry for being a little bit. Um, sort of discombobulated this morning. Uh, that's certainly not normal for me, as you guys know. So thank you for um, for your patience. Oh, great question, Eve. I've been meaning to ask the photo of you and Katrina is, what is the jumper that K Katrina is wearing? It is her, let me see if I can find it. Um, it is her, she, it's out of her own yarn. Uh, it was yarn that she dyed, and she chose that. That particular one was a sweater that she did that was by Jose. She's a local to me crafter, Jose Paquin, um, and that was the sweater. I'm just looking at. I'm looking at it. That's why I keep saying um. It was a really simple v-neck that she does. I wish Katrina was in the chat today, but I know that she's busy. It was a v-neck, it was very simple, and Katrina actually waffled about whether or not she should make it because um, she was torn between some other sweater patterns that she was looking at for that same yarn, and um, it ended up. she ended up choosing that one but it was a really, really simple pattern. I'll find out and I'll throw it in the show notes, but I'm pretty sure, 
I'm pretty sure it was this one, so I'll link it in the chat. I'm pretty sure it was that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, did you wear your cowl when you're out walking? Um, yeah, not Josie. Uh, it's Jose. So J O S E E. She's francophone. Uh, she's from Quebec. So for the uh, for today, um, I was really um, having trouble with my screens. Just give me a sec here, you guys. Um, I wanted to start off. So we were gonna normally at the beginning of the show we do sort of a breed and color study reflection, and we talk about the community and and what people are working on. And currently we've got our organic poll worth going. And I thought today what we could do. And I'm going to start doing this sort of going forward because now that the podcast is weekly, we have so many more options around what we can talk about and what we can share and what we can do. So I really wanted to start pulling out photos and projects that people are posting online in the Ravelry group that um, highlight the things that you guys are doing because there is so much talent in our community and so many people doing such amazing things that I thought that that would be really wonderful to be able to do. So um, let's start off with chatting about our 51 yarn spin along. So for those who would like to join into this spin along and would like to hop on, group B just started. So they are starting from the beginning this month and group A is over a year in. So they're not, they're sort of up, up and on their way and sort of doing their thing. But if you would like to join um, in, you can absolutely join in with group B. So this was a submission that was towards the beginning, um, and this was Group A. Lizzie, Liz posted this way back in January or February a year ago, and um, what she did for her fine wool study from the from the book. So we're looking at the Fifty One Yarns book by J C Boggs Faulkner. Fifty One yarns that every spinner should spin in his or her spinning career in their spinning career before you cast off. And we started sort of at the beginning of the book with fine with wool classification. And we started with fine and medium wools. So I'll put that down somewhere that's not gonna fall. And so Liz started off with this beautiful merino from Leesburg, Virginia. I She bought it as a fleece in 2017 and had it scoured and made into top. Um, at a local, I'm, I'm assuming it's a local mill at Zellinger's. I saved two locks and have them in the photo below, along with the micron count and staple length data that came with the fleece. I have five pounds of it and decided to work with 20 grams for this spin along. Do not have time to spin it all up now. And her spinning is just beautiful. So she did a few different um samples she did a uh, two ply she kept some of her singles and then i think she ended up settling on a three ply and that swatch that you saw um had some cables in there as well and you can tell she was kind of playing around with some different stitches just really beautiful way of chronicling her fiber and chronicling her project and keeping herself organized which we're going to talk about next with some somebody from the group from group b and she says, um, I spun with a short forward draw, with a forward draw, forcing myself to hold my back hand still by keeping my elbow to my body. So she would have been spinning like this, like holding her, her elbow into her side so that she didn't move her arm. I find that's really helpful for myself as well to keep myself from defaulting to short backward. I really do not like spinning forward draw as I need to really focus on my hands. I do like the resulting yarn. It's a three ply with a twist angle of 40 degrees. It's really nice. Uh, she used the 14 to one ratio on her Kromsky Sonata and in the swatch she experimented with different cables and she actually has four yarn overs in there as well. But she, but I will not say I have four eyelets because you really cannot see them, but not surprised based on the yarn. And the reason why she's not surprised is because three ply tends to sort of come into itself. They don't, um, whereas a two ply really blooms out and pushes against itself and creates really lovely lace. 
I should have taken a photo of the skein prior to knitting up the swatch. She will try to remember to do that for the next study. Look at that crimp. Isn't that amazing? The crimp is just incredible. So thank you, Liz, for sharing. That was at the very beginning. That was only post number 187, and we're up to several thousand now for this spin along for group A. So thank you so much, Liz, for sharing. And what we're going to do is we'll wor slowly work our way through group A and highlight some of these projects that people are working on so that um, you guys can see what people are working on. So for group B, they're just getting up and getting started. They're right at the beginning of their study. So this was a submission from Colleen, post number 47 in the group B thread. So they're just starting, like I said, she just read through all of the posts and sh saw that there were two questions to answer. So I had posted two questions for people to contemplate as they were getting started with their spin along. And we did the same thing with group A. So what I asked them was, what do you want to achieve from the study? And what fibers are you going to use for the first few months? So what Colleen said, and the reason why I wanted to share this was it was very thoughtful, her response, and I think very helpful for those who are sort of planning a bigger study like this and a bigger spin like this. Um, for her, her answer to number one, she wants to achieve, what she wants to achieve is to understand how to spin different fibers and gain more confidence when she's spinning different fibers. I think this is huge. And when you start to kind of, you know, stash dive and toss your stash and pull out different fibers that you want to spin for a study like this, or if you're hoping to participate in the Zero to Hero this year, which is a very open-ended spin along that we're doing in the community, um, you choose some fiber, you can either go from the raw fleece, you can go from the fiber, you can engage in the dyeing process, you can um, work from hand painted comb top, it's really up to you, but it needs to be, the spinning needs to be a part of your process. Um, be, gaining confidence in working with different fibers, pulling something out of your stash that you've maybe been keeping for several years because you're not quite at that point where you're ready to take on that fiber. That's really what studies like this are all about is taking on small samples of fiber and just sitting at the wheel and allowing yourself to play and to experiment and be open-minded and be willing to admit that not everything is going to work out and that some things that you spin in this spin along and that you chronicle and that you organize um, as you look back through your projects are not going to work out um, and being okay with that. <clears throat> for her answer for number two, she went through her fiber stash and she has several sample packs that she picked up over the last few years. So she selected Merino for fine fiber and BFL for the medium, which is a great place to start. Some people would classify BFL as a long wool and some people put it in as a medium wool and it really depends on where the BFL was raised the staple length how long it is um, and it qualify it can qualify for each the photo is her table filled with the sample packs of alpaca from alpaca to shetland so she's got lots of different stuff sitting there that she's hoping to work through as a part of the spin along which is wonderful so good luck colleen and we're here to support you All right, the next thing that I wanted to share with you was a, was a series of photos actually, and I didn't set this up separately ahead of time, which I probably should have. But to be honest with you, it's kind of been one of those days. I'm so excited to share this with you guys. So this is a project that was submitted on the hand spun knitting thread on Ravelry. By Glenda Mad Stasher Mad Stasher one on Ravelry. And you guys will probably recognize if you've been watching for long enough um, that these roll eggs I made for a giveaway on the podcast um, a while ago and Nora had picked some of the the colors and we had made these roll eggs off of the drum card or no off of the blending board for for two people so there were these ones um, that I had made that were sort of um, the colors were a little bit more striping uh, not so 
and not super, super blended. And then the other set were really super blended and I think I had added in white. So Glenda got these ones as part of the giveaway and she spun up this yarn and then she made this beautiful butterfly cowl that's by Marin Melquar and just absolutely gorgeous use of the yarn and I'm really quite amazed I have to say I'm amazed at how far the yardage went she Glenda got really good yardage because that is a lot of knitting in that cowl um, the colored section that is this yarn that she put with the light gray like that's not an insignificant amount of yarn in there in the cowl so I hope that she is getting lots of use out of it because it's absolutely beautiful so well done. So that's from the uh, hand spun knitting thread in our Ravelry group. And that thread is for people to show off what they've knit from their hand spun. You can either share photos of, you know, the fiber and the yarn and then the resulting project. Sometimes people put in um, collages of the different steps and the different stuff with some with the resulting photos. And some people just share the final the final object. So I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning, Becca. You're absolutely right. And what a wonderful use for this type of fiber where you've got lots of blending, uh, lots of places in the finished yarn where there is clean color, areas where there's a little bit of barber pulling and a little bit of uh, color twisting. And then in the finished patterning, you don't lose any of the actual pattern because you've got the gray sort of helping to delineate the, the wings of the butterfly. It's just absolutely beautiful. Stunning, Glenda, very beautiful. Oh, hi, Erica. So your son let you watch today, that's wonderful. Yeah, oh, you're doing the shawl candy, that's wonderful, that's awesome. You're gonna have to share it. Uh, make sure you, you show it to us. So we don't have any breed and color studies today. Uh, I thought that we would uh, take a break for, for a week and uh, so that we could talk about some of those other things that we wanted to share. But I did want to share with you some finished yarn. So many of you who have been watching the podcast for a while, and if you're new to the podcast, welcome. Um, and if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. And if you're a patron of the show, thank you so much for your support. So this is a large spinning project that I have been working on throughout the winter. I started talking about it on the podcast back in November and then it took me a little bit to kind of get going with the spinning and whatnot and I started spinning this skein um, over the Christmas break and I got it finished really quickly and I think really I got it finished so fast because I was I've been I was so sick um, I just sat at my wheel and and worked away at it and I've talked a lot about this particular skein and how I spun it but one of the things that I've been working on and making sure that I have been really good about is saving samples of my singles and the unwashed two-ply yarn um, as part of my this project because this will eventually be a reflective course on the School of Sweet Georgia. So this, um, this fiber... Uh, came from uh, Sweet Georgia Yarns, so I'll try not to uh, shake the table. This fiber is from Sweet Georgia Yarns, and it was a limited edition colorway that they did back during the week of Spin Together in the UK. Um, there were three different fiber bases. There was Gotland, which is this one here. There was Superwash Targi, which is actually still braided and in its bag in the other room. And then there was um, merino, sorry, alpaca merino silk, which is this skein here. And actually, I don't have, I don't have my, oh, I do. Hang on. I think last week I had, I didn't have the tag close by, so I couldn't share the ratios the of, of fiber to... Uh, fiber content of this one of this one here um, so this is merino so alpaca merino silk I'm pretty sure it's not superwash merino I'm pretty sure it's 100% merino but it's 50% alpaca 30% merino and 20% silk and the colorway was called falling leaves and like I said it was a limited edition colorway but it was really kind of fun because uh, or what was so neat about it, I should say, is that because they chose three different fiber bases to dye the colorway on, it meant that each of the colorways was very different. So the Targi is sort of like a middle 
a middle of the road like like if I was to sort of go light to dark the targi would go right here so when I'm finished spinning the targi um, it would go in the middle here and I think I showed on the podcast last time but I'll show it to you again um, these are the braids of fiber so the on the very very far I guess it would be your right um, is the alpaca merino silk and then in the middle there is the superwash targi and then right here down below is the gotland um, so you can see the same dyes same colors same distribution of color and yet how different they are on the different fibers and the gotland because it was already a dark gray and we've done gotland on on gray because gotland is often gray or dark gray uh, it's not a naturally white fiber um, we did that for one of our for one of our very first breed and color studies and we looked at it um, the colorway on on Gotland and then we did a contrast with BFL which was actually Rebecca's um, suggestion and I don't know Rebecca's in the uh, in the chat um, so she was actually the one that got Katrina and I talking and thinking about doing these multiple different fibers or or multiple different colors to really fully explore color for the breed and color studies. So Rebecca can definitely take um, credit for that. So the Gotland for the Sweet Georgia um, colors, uh, these three colorways, um, the Gotland was sort of the darkest of the three and the alpaca merino silk, because of how alpaca and silk take the dye, came out sort of the lightest and then the targi that's right there in the middle is sort of what I would think of as sort of the stereotypical way that fiber takes the dyes, the acid dyes. Uh, and that is certainly that one there is the one that we, we very much see hanging on the wall at fiber festivals. Most of the fibers sort of take the color that way, whether it's targi or Polworth or BFL. Uh, BFL tends to have more sheen, but the colors are, are, are very similar. So when I, as I've been spinning these, these different yarns, these different fibers, um, it's been really interesting to see how the colors have come up very differently. So this one is the merino, the alpaca merino silk, and you can see just the sheen on there. And the finished yarn, it's a two ply. The finished yarn uh, colors are very, they're very gentle, they're very soft, um, they're very blended. Um, you can really see the individual colors. You can see that coral orange in there, but then you can also see the blue. Um, it came out really beautifully. I kept the twist angle a little bit higher than I normally would for a yarn like this. Um, you can see the twist angle there is a little bit more severe. Um, a yarn like this with the alpaca and the silk in there, um, it um, you know tends to have a lot of natural drape. This is washed and finished. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with how this came out, um, but it has a really nice drape. I'll lay it down there for you guys to really see it. And you can see how the colors, um, you know, they, they, they are barber pulled in places, but then there's big areas where they really matched up and the plying went really well. So I had split the braid into six nests. I had found that the more that I split it, the more it started to drift apart and fall apart because there's nothing for the alpaca or the silk to grab onto. They don't have scales like wool does unless it's treated wool and it's superwash so um i split it six times and i spun three of the nests to one bobbin three of the nests to the other bobbin end to end starting at the same end each time rewound the singles onto weaving bobbins to ply from so that i was spinning from the first spun end or plying from the first spun end and then I plied it up and I'm really happy with how this turned out. Now the finished twist angle was a little bit different. Um, I don't know if the webcam is the best place to show you or if maybe I should put it on the uh, other camera, but you can see here how much tighter and finer the yarn was before um, unwashed versus washed. There is quite a difference in bloom factor uh, between the two and the twist angle when I was plying was much closer, I know it's a bit dark, but th maybe that's a good way for you to see it. The twist angle was um, more like 45 degrees and the finished yarn is sort of more like between 35 and 40 degree twist angle. And then the Gotland is so dark, it's so hard to see. But again, the twist angle is a little bit more severe than I would normally put for a coarser 
a coarser wool like this um, but it will be washed the plan is to weave with this these yarns so I wanted a little bit higher twist to withstand the um, the tension of the loom so there is that to to think about and you can see the sheen of the gotland and it's so dark and moody and the colors are so um, they're not they're not quite as as um like with this one there's a lot of barber pulling and a lot of contrast in those areas where like the you know the orange and the purple twisted together or the um the the orange and the blue twisted together but with this in those areas it's not particularly noticeable it's much more subtle um i think of this as very dark and still it's quiet this one's a little bit brighter it's lighter a little bit more like summer so very happy with how these two yarns came out. Um, I'm we I'm spinning them up as a two ply to maximize yardage, and um, I didn't want a round three ply for weaving with. I wanted a a slightly more oval uh, shape to my yarn and a um, um, and a two ply. But I didn't want to leave them as singles because this the targi is super wash, and this merino alpaca merino silk is uh, has that alpaca and that silk in there so i wanted i wanted this the stability and the strength of a two ply yarn but again just a little bit higher twist a little bit stronger than i normally would for knitting with so if i were to keep these yarns for knitting i would have significantly decreased the twist angle in the gotland even pre-washing so this would have been a little bit more gent um, a gentler twist angle and then this one, um, um, probably a, a, just a, just a tad less. Yes, agreed, Kelly. Yeah, love the Gotland skein. So subtle, just makes my heart flutter. I totally agree. This, of these two, the Gotland is the one that I tend to navigate toward. It's certainly the one that's sort of more my colors. Um, it's the one that I'm the most excited about, which I think is why I was so motivated to get this spin done so that I could work on the other two. Because the one that I'm the most, most excited about is the Targi. Mostly because I think it'll be wonderful to have one that's right in the middle and then to be able to put the three together and contrast them and talk about them on the show. Because this has sort of ended up being like my own mini breed and color study a little bit because, um, um, of course, I'm working on this as like content. So I'm thinking about it a little bit more critically, a little bit more intentionally, and um, really kind of planning this out. So I don't know what my um, yardage is yet of any of these skeins. I'll wash the Gotland and then I'm, I am going to go ahead and reskein these two to get an idea of yardage so that I can start planning the project. So. How do you decide how much fiber to set aside for sampling? I'm greedy and want to use all the fiber for a project. Yes, I know what you mean, Suzanne. So when I first started spinning, I found it very challenging to set aside any amount of fiber for a project because I felt like, you know, if you take off like the end <clears throat> of, say, for a four ounce braid, it's like, but you're taking off so much. Like that's so much fiber to take away. I totally get it. Um, so what I have started to do is two things. Um, I will take the braid and sort of fold it, lay it out on the ground, and I will sort of fold it. Let me show you a an example of this from this month's teaching content, actually, that's going to come out in the How I Spin, in the How I Spin um, vlog. So a little bit of a spoiler for the How I Spin. Let me just move over to that content and I'll pop it up right now and we'll talk about it really quickly. Uh, where is it? Where did I save it? There is a method to my madness. It may not seem to be a method to my madness, but I do have everything really organized. And um, so what I'll do is um, I lay the fiber out. Oops. There we go. I lay the fiber out often on the floor like this and I will have a look at what the color repeat is and then I will start to strip the fiber depending on how many times I want to strip it and I'll lay it out and sort of get an idea of what the color repeats will look like and sort of how the colors are dyed, what the length of the fiber is that the, the, the dye has been placed on and then I start to work backwards around how much of that colorway can I take away to do some sampling so if I take like this right here this photo is the entire 
braid. I haven't stripped it. I haven't done anything with it. So what I'll do is take that and off of the one side all the way down, I'll take a very, very narrow strip of fiber um, that's about half of the width of my finger and that will become my sampling fiber. And so that can be anywhere from, you know, five grams to nine or 10 grams. It just depends on how much of the colorway. If there's a repeat to the color, um, so if I wanna make sure that I work my way through all of the color, or if I want to work my way through just one colorway repeat, it, that depends. And that's how I take the fiber off of a four ounce braid to, to start sampling with. Um, and part of the reason why I do that is because it gives me an opportunity to play with the actual fiber itself. And it also gives me an opportunity to uh, play with the color and what I want to do with the color. Do I want to make a self-striping yarn and I want to chain ply? Do I want to make a two ply? Um, if I'm thinking about doing a blended three ply, like a traditional three ply, where I'm going to strip the fiber and strip the fiber and strip the fiber, throw it into a basket and just spin randomly, I will often take that length of fiber, spin it end to end, and I will do a bracelet of that fiber and I will bracelet ply it so that it's like a center pull ball. And we talked about that on the last show on episode 134 about bracelet plying, or sorry, about spinning, uh, plying from a center pull ball and the pros and cons. But for a sample, it gives you a really good idea of what those colors are gonna look like when they're blended and when they're um, uh, twisted together, when there's color twisting and marling and barber pulling in your finished skein. Because even if you're only looking at a two ply, it gives you an idea of what that three ply might look like without actually having to bring out three bobbins to spin two or three yards of yarn to and then plying. Does that make sense? So that's how I do it. And if I'm doing sampling for a larger project like the 51 yarns where I'm really trying to understand about a fiber and I'm really trying to understand about what it is that I'm doing, I will take more of one fiber and it's fiber from something that's not for a bigger project that I'm not coveting that fiber for something else. So I often don't spin from a four ounce braid or sample from a four ounce braid unless that entire braid is going to be a whole bunch of different samples for something. So for example, right now in the 51 yarn spin along group A, they're just starting their second year. So they're working on yarns 26, 27, 28, and 29 right now, which are right from the center of the book. And it's all about color management. So for those samples, I've taken one braid, I've actually taken two, and I'm spinning a whole bunch of samples for that, for that teaching content for you guys, so that you can see how that stuff works up and how those that one colorway can be spun all these different ways. Very reminiscent of the work that Katrina and I did in our book, Unbraided. And for those who are new to the podcast and new to me and haven't met me before, the book that I'm talking about is me and Katrina's book, Unbraided, The Art and Science of Spinning Color. And that is linked down below in the show notes. And what Katrina and I did was we took colorways and we spun them a whole bunch of different ways to start helping people understand how this stuff spins up from one braid. So the links for that are in the show notes. And actually there was a review in the most recent ep um, issue of Spin Off Magazine. There was a review of the book, which was very kind of them. So I hope that helps. Um, you can always frog your sample in a pinch, absolutely, and it can always be a pocket lining or something less important. That's a really good point, Charlotte. So one of the things that I um, have done over the years, and it's only happened to me a couple of times, so I have to admit it's not something that has happened to me a lot, but I know Brenda Dane of Cast On, if you ever listen to that podcast, it's over now and she's finished, but the episodes are still available. She often talked about ripping out her hand spun samples her hand spun swatching samples to use in her garment because um, she would not necessarily run out of yarn, but she needed to reclaim that yarn for the project. And she had taken that yardage into consideration for her um, project. And so she needed to reclaim that yarn after the swatching process was done. Yeah, you're right, Eve. Um, spinning to knit color. Is it spinning to... 
what's that course called? It's Felicia's course on blueprint. Um, it was one of the original craftsy classes, um, spinning, spinning to, oh my goodness, the name of the course is on the tip of my tongue and I cannot think of it. If somebody thinks of the actual name, please, uh, please let me know or post it in the chat. Spinning to die, dying to spin color, spinning to dye color, spinning to net color. Anyways, it was about spinning color. Very, very good. Okay. Can I just say that Kid Silk Haze is an awesome core for a beginner? Yes, because it's so grippy. <laughs> um, absolutely. Okay, I am going to put these away and I've lost my bag. Oh, here it is. I've been keeping this project together so that I don't lose these cards that I've been making for um, for the workshop. And actually I haven't written yet, um, the Gotland sampling. Um, you can see how I have my notes there for the alpaca merino silk, but now I need to add in the Gotland and then the Targi will go here and then the write-up of the, of the Targi. I normally use index cards for my sampling, but I find for, um, magazine articles, like if I'm writing for Ply Magazine or if I'm, doing something for the School of Sweet Georgia. Um, I actually find the index cards aren't great because you only see that one project on it. I find having sort of more of like a painter's palette strip and then being able to wrap the singles and be able to show all together in one spot. Um, sorry for the crinkling. Um, I find that a little bit easier when I'm when I'm teaching and when I'm when I'm talking to this stuff. So, um, yeah. Okay, are you guys ready to do the unboxing? Um, I did. I forgot to. Oh, spinning dyed fibers. That's what it is, Eve. Wonderful. Uh, I did forget to mention this month's giveaway. If you pop into the Ravelry group in the January episode thread, um, if you tell us what you learned in 2019, that bat right there will go out to you. Um, I'll do a random number the first show of February. We, um, all of the packages that were sitting here because of the snow day from last week that I hadn't been able to get to the mailbox just yet, that stuff's all gone out. The snow is pretty much gone. And, uh, yeah. Okay. You guys ready? I'm so excited. Um, this is actually sitting here for a reason. You'll see why in a sec. Okay. So, a little bit of background, um, Kate Sherratt of uh, Ashford, um, she's their marketing manager, director, um, she does a lot of their teaching content whatnot. Her and I have met a number of times because they've been coming up for Fibers West in Knit City for the last few years and they've been working with Sweet Georgia Yarns as well as some of the other um, retailers up here. And um, they're wonderful people, um, Kate is lovely. And I've really enjoyed getting to know her. We've had some really good chats. We've exchanged quite a number of emails. And she's just like a really wonderful person. So um, her and I were chatting and I had reached out to her to have a conversation. And one of the things that I had really regretted last year when I was um, sort of rearranging tools and figuring out what I was going to do was uh, selling my e-spinner. And it's not because I used it a ton at the time. It was more the convenience of having it and using my cart and wheeling it around with me. And um, so we her and her and I also got chatting about those in my this community and the wool and spinning community, as well as the community at large who either physically can't treadle um, or treadling isn't realistic because of you know physical ailments or whatever. Um, or or um, you know, there's lots of reasons why people can't treadle on a treadle machine, on a, on a treadle wheel, um, but also sort of the modern um, convenience of having um, an electric wheel. So we were talking and chatting and blah, blah, blah. And they sent me one, which is lovely. And I am so incredibly thankful. Um, they, like I said, they are wonderful people at Ashford. And so what we are going to be sort of doing going forward on the podcast is talking a lot, um, about these different wheels, um, spindles. We talk about spindles sort of, um, uh, not a ton because I don't pull out my spindles. I really work on my spindles in the spring, summer and fall. 
Um, but going forward on the podcast, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, treadling on a wheel and the advantages and disadvantages and working on an e-spinner and the advantages and disadvantages and talking about project planning and sampling and sort of what that process looks like and how it differs on an electric machine versus a treadle machine and kind of comparing and contrasting the yarns, looking at plying and how that differs um, and also just the convenience of some of this stuff and being able to work on these wheels um you know when you can wheel it around the house literally because i do find my treadle wheels they do get in the way um they do uh take up a lot of space i'm not going to get rid of my lendrum or my magicraft by any stretch um but i have kind of come to the conclusion that i don't need to accrue any more treadle wheels at this point so i am going to just move things around a little bit and then we're going to unbox it So I haven't opened this yet. I have been waiting for you guys. Um, and part of the reason is because I, I, because I owned one in the past, I know what to expect from the inside. Um, we're going to turn the cameras around and we will get this uh, opened up. There we go. So one of the things that I really like about the uh, e-spinner is the fact that it comes with a bag um i don't the hansen i don't think comes with a bag or you buy it separately um when i had had a hansen um there was there wasn't a bag um and i think for the affordability of the ashford um e-spinner i think i think it is a it is an advantage for sure um to get a bag for portability sake that is one thing actually when we were camping i had taken my hansen with me and um, not having a bag to put it in, I I really regretted not 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 getting one. Um, it was a bit of a it just gets it gets dirty. So they send you a little bit of test fiber that you can play with. Um, it's their their own um, Corydale that they do. I'm gonna turn the gain down a little bit so that you guys aren't hearing all of the crinkling. So the bobbins for the e-spinner are huge and I'll put liters on these later. And I think this comes with three. <laughs> Motor home projects, that's awesome Florence. And Sarah, I didn't know you were saving up for one, that's wonderful. That is one nice thing um, about them, they are, they are affordable. Um, I know in Canadian dollars they're less than, less than a thousand, which is huge. So this is the flyer and let's pull out the actual physical. So this is the, the physical uh, wheel and this actually pops right in here. And it slides all the way back. Actually, I should throw a bobbin on first, so hang on. <clears throat> let's put a bobbin on. And I will have to um, oil this and kind of get it running. So that goes together like that. These are sliding hooks. So you squeeze and it slides. And they do loosen up with time like my old one. Um, it this, this really um, started to work quite well. The other thing that I did with my old one, and I'll do it with this one as well, is I put a little, just a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit of um, beeswax on here that I had gotten from something else for from Katrina for some reason. I can't remember why I ended up with that. Um, I'm trying to remember why I had the beeswax from her, but I still have it. And then this slides into here. Here, let me move the box as I smash and bang things. Okay. So I'll put this underneath here so you guys can see. And I'll make myself a little bit smaller because you don't really need to see me right now. Um, you need to see this. So this looks like this. And this slides back into here. And I know the 
first couple of times that I did it, it was really, really stiff. So I'll do that in just a sec. We've got stuff here, another bobbin. I have had to dig so deep this past week to not unbox this thing before, before uh, the podcast. I said to my husband, I was like, maybe I should put in an, like a bonus episode on and do like a live stream on like Friday. And he kind of looked at me. He's like, you already do it every week. He's like, that seems excessive. I was like, I don't, I don't think it's excessive. How is it excessive? And he just started laughing at me. I was like, oh, but to be obsessed like we all are. So this is the, um, the pedal. They have changed that actually since my other one. My other one was, um, uh, on my first one, it was uh, like a guitar um, pedal. So this is a little bit different. This feels a little bit more, this could be a like it could go um, on the floor. I often used it as a hand, like I just hit it with my hand. And then this is the um, outlet, the power outlet. And there's adapters in here for different uh, countries. All of mine just went flying. So I had kept my other ones I had kept um, I had actually kept them um, in the bag um, but I think what I will do this year this time is I actually will keep them somewhere in the office because I found that I was always these were always falling out of the bag every time I opened it and I was always worried that I was going to lose them because if I ever were to travel like if I went to the UK, for example, for um, like a spinning retreat or a get together or something, um, I obviously would need would need it, but I don't necessarily need to be carrying it around all the time. So that was definitely something that I um, I need to keep them, but I don't necessarily need to keep them in the bag. All right, so in here is um, all of the little bits and pieces that you need to sort of start putting the wheel together. So that's what we'll do. Um, we'll put the wheel together and I'll show you how the Lazy Kate works. Um, probably there is the best place. So these go in here. So they go in like that. They send you with a little bit of oil, spinning wheel oil. Sorry for the glare from the light. Um, spinning wheel oil, non-staining. This is your yarn guide for your uh, Lazy Kate for when you're plying. And this just pops in. And then um, this is your orifice reducer. So this, what happens when you have such a big orifice, see how big this, this hole is? Um, it's, a, it's nice to be able to reduce it down and to make it a little bit smaller to reduce um, the shake. Um, I would even like to see one a little bit smaller, but this is really nice and it just pops right in like that. This is your orifice hook. So like the Lendrum, um, they send you a little orifice hook and it actually just pops right in the side there. And the nice thing about that is actually when you pull it out, it's right there. Um, it really does jam in there quite, quite nicely. Um, 
but I also found that um, I didn't need it all the time. So it was there and I knew it was there, but I didn't always have to use it. And because this is plastic and the inside here of the flyer is plastic in here, um, you um, you don't have to, you're not worried about like scratching anything or, or causing degradation of your uh, flyer over time. That goes like that. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so those two things are done. Now you've got two tension um, bobbin, uh, tension sort of knobs. Um, one of them goes on your wheel and the other one, sorry, I'm looking at the cameras so I can make sure everything's in the frame. One of them goes on your Lazy Kate and one of them actually goes on your physical wheel. So that, one of them goes there and the other one goes on here. Now they have changed the setup of the um, tension of when, I, so when I had this the first time, they sent fishing wire for the brake band because this is scotch tension. Most of the e-spinners are scotch tension. I'm not sure I've actually seen one that's not scotch tension. So this sets up by screwing into here, down here. Hang on. I guess I should show you guys the uh, the uh, manual. So they send you with all of this. Um, they send you with a um, a um, all of their products, and then they also send you with. Um, the instructions. So it's just a PDF. You can get these online. It's a PDF download. And um, it shows you how everything goes together, where to oil everything, and how to set up your brake band. So what they want you to do is cut the nylon brake band into two pieces. One is for the Lazy Kate, and then one is for the Scotch Tension. And um, I... So that was actually one of the very first things that I switched out on this was I switched out for a different brake band. Um, I ended up using something that was more like this, um, which is sort of some, um, I think this is actually silk yarn. Um, I would prefer to use some linen, but I don't know that I have any close by near nearby to actually show you. Um, so this is your nylon brake band and they want you to cut this in half and use half of it for your Lazy Kate. Like I said. And then they want you to take this black waxed leather kind of piece. I don't know if this is waxed leather or if it's waxed nylon. And they want you to attach that between, yeah, black waxed thread. Um, they want you to attach that between the um, your tension knob and the one of the hook and eyes and one of the springs so that everything is sort of sprung spring loaded. So I am probably not going to do that with mine because I didn't like the nylon brake band. So that's the uh, Lazy Kate there. What I like for brake bands, or yeah, for tension bands, is actually to use 2 8 cotton. So that is what I am going to put on my Lazy Kate. So if you have some patience for a moment, I will show you how I set that up. And you can, anybody can do this. And you can, you can switch out your stuff. Like you don't have to, I think Felicia fit two or three four ounce braids on one bobbin, I feel like recently I think she did oh, there's a bunch of noise outside I wonder what's going on does anybody else use an orifice reducer I'm just curious 
Um, is that something that you guys have used? That's why people like them for applying. Absolutely, absolutely, Diane and Meg. That's Megan, exactly. That's that's why people like them. It's because you can fit so much fiber on them. The trade-off, of course, and this is something that Abby Frankmont has talked about on her blog, um, is that you get the shake. And bigger isn't necessarily always better. You know, I'm not, I don't love spinning lace yarn to really big bobbins because you get a lot of shake. And, uh, oh my gosh. My, my, uh, my, I, I tied on the thing, but then my, my, uh, cause I'm using surgical scissors cause I steal these from work when we don't end up using them and they would end up just getting thrown out. Um, they caught the, the thread as well, which is no good. So I'll cut that off and we'll redo it. Not a big deal. Yeah, so Diane says that her Lendrum shakes a lot with her large bobbins with the jumbo flyer. So we've talked about that on the podcast before. And I really only use my jumbo bobbins and my jumbo flyer. My plant that I think some people call that the plying head, but I call it just the jumbo. Um, the jumbo head or the jumbo jumbo bobbins. Um, I really only use that on my Lendrum for uh, textured yarn and art yarn because I like the ratios of that head. But I also find that um, it shakes too much, even with the changes that you can make to the brake band and making the brake band um, go like this, where it actually crosses at the back underneath the bobbin. That helps a little bit. But I don't find that it helps enough to really make that much of a difference. So there's my tensioner, and I really only use the tensioner when I am spinning stuff like, um, well, when I'm chain plying. That's, that's when I use it. And now I'm not sure, I'm just gonna look up really quickly if you guys don't mind um, being patient for a moment. I'm not sure how they want, yeah, they want you to use a, a spring so they want you to tie it on to one of these I'll try and hold it so you guys can see maybe it's better to hold it here one of these so you've got the hook and eye and then a, a, a bobbin a, a, a spring a spring here so they want you to pop that in here so there's a hole that's pre-drilled for you right there and they want you to pop that in there so I will do that really quickly you guys can keep chatting and I'll try and catch up. Catch up with the chat. Oh, bye Erica, it's so good to have you here. Oh, that's interesting, Sarah. That your your uh, your your Ashford traditional with the new jumbo flyer doesn't shake a ton. That's really good to know. Yeah, it's the fine control. So that's one of the reasons why I don't like the nylon brake bands. Um, I want a little bit more control than the nylon can give me. And actually, when I was still teaching at the Sweet Georgia Studio, and I would teach uh, beginning spinning. Um, that was one of the first things that I noticed when I was demoing on a Ashford Joy was um, the nylon brake band I wanted to switch out, um, and I did. Um, it wasn't my wheel, but I asked the owner um, if she would mind if I, if I switched it out, and uh, she said that that was no problem, and so I did. And I found that um, the student that was using it, um, who is a true beginner, had never really even knit before, um, uh, really wasn't struggling as much as a result just because of having that ability to uh, um, attain that finer finer degree of control. So I think that's a very um, real thing. Just popping the spring onto the um, hook and then I will connect the I'll tie the cotton on and I'll show you sort of what this setup looks like. This is probably like the only like major modification that I would make is not to use the nylon. Um, obviously if that's what works for you and you like the nylon go for it and use it. 
Um, there is absolutely no hard and fast rule that says that you can't not use the nylon. It's just my own personal preference. We all have our personal preferences. Um, and I just happen to prefer um, nylon or cotton. And the cotton degrades after a while and it, it breaks down a little bit. Um, and I just replace it in time. Normally I would use a, a linen. Um, I just don't, I don't think I have any linen right now, to be honest. I need to probably get some. All right, so that is what the tensioner looks like when it's all set up. You've got the tension very ever so slightly along the back of your bobbins. You don't want it set tight when, when you're actually chain plying. You certainly don't want it to be set um, tightly that you've got um, any resistance to your bobbins. You want them to still continue to turn and spin um, so that as you're plying, you, you can pull off your bobbin, but you don't want them back spinning. That's the reason for tensioning, um, for tensioning a... Um, a lazy Kate. I also find, you guys are going to laugh at me, I also find it very helpful to tension a lazy Kate when you're moving it around a lot because the bobbins tend to stay put. They don't fall off. Which I know is kind of a silly thing to say, but it's true. All right, so for the rest of this, I'm going to take this off. Just put it back here in the bag for just a sec. Um, I just need to put these on and I'm going to take these off of the, um, these, um, these came attached. Um, one of them I needed to have attached and the other two are not, not together on the one side of the wheel and the other two need to be attached, which is why they come that way from Ashford. But I take them off and put them back on after I've put the screws into the wheel because to be honest with you, I just find them easier to work with. So I take them apart and then I'll pop them into the wheel and then I'll pop them back on. You guys with me? Oh, and of course this one won't come apart. It's like one continuous shoot. I might have to switch things out. Oh, darn. So I'm going to have to switch these because this one is um, set up so that it... Hang on. Bear with me. Making changes and it's already biting me in the butt. Yeah, you're right, Becca. There is that whole article on drive bands and the materials and what people like and don't like. Um, Ply Magazine, I don't know about you guys, but it is such an awesome resource, hey? Like, I find if I'm wondering about something or I'm kind of stuck about something or I'm not really sure or kind of hit like a bit of a roadblock, they are a huge resource, you know, just for like that you know, je ne sais quoi sometimes. I mean, you just are like, ah, oh, like what, you know, trying to figure stuff out. It's such a huge um, body of knowledge now that there's so many years of Ply Magazine too. Like it's, you can see the, uh, the issues behind me here. Those are all the issues right there. All the issues of Ply Magazine are on that shelf of my bookshelf. And I keep them there so that I can grab them when I'm working on content and um, you know, needing to reference something or needing to, to, you know, um, figure something out. And I just find they're just such a huge, huge resource. Hmm. I'm going to have to play with this later because now it won't come apart. Oh, I wonder if that's what happened. Hang on. Bear with me two seconds. Adjustments on the fly. That's what we do. It's so true, Diane. Hey, like, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always finding that like 
Well, I was talking to Erica and um, Eve about this this morning, actually. Uh, you know, we're 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 living in a time and living in a world where, you know, there's so we have so much access to information, and we can really learn so much from one another. And um, you know, if we spend that little bit of time reflecting upon, you know, our our own making and our own crafting and our process. Um, you know, we have so, so, so much that we can share with one another and so much that we can um, do and, and by, by extension grow. And I think many of us, um, you know, do this work because we really enjoy that moving meditation and that opportunity to spend that time um, you know, reflecting on things and doing those things and doing that work. So we do tend to kind of push push the envelope a little bit and push 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 through. No way. You've been fixing up an old sewing machine? That's incredible, Rebecca. Yeah, it's true, Suzanne. You aren't afraid to make adjustments um, to your to your tools. And I think a lot of that is it's a it's a certain level of confidence that you start to develop over time. What you know you like, what your preferences are what you don't like, um, products that you've tried, um, adjustments that friends have made, um, things that teachers have shown you. That's a big one. What mentors and teachers show. I'm always finding that I'm thinking outside, you know, thinking of new things and thinking of new ideas and stuff when I, when I see my spinning mentors trying things. Okay, so I didn't have to take this apart after all because I was able to get the other one apart. But, you know, that seems to be my week this week. Do everything 10 times and then on the 11th time it all works out. We got Nora ice skates. And she had rented um, ice skates and they were a size 11 and they were fine. Went and got her secondhand skates, um, which are even so better than the rental skates. <sighs> I'm sure you can predict the end of this story. They're too small. So my husband after school today is going to see if he can go and let them exchange them because they're secondhand, right, from a secondhand store. And those places are notorious for not letting you do returns or any kind of refund. or So, so frustrating. All right, so that's the one side. So I pop that in there and we're gonna pop in the other side. Sorry, this is taking so long. We're way over time on the on the chat. If you guys uh, need to go, I totally understand. Although I do love sitting here chatting with you. I could chat with you all day. All right, so there's the hook and eye on both sides. And then the spring goes on the one side because you're basically spring loading your brake band. So we're gonna tie the one side on and then we are going to put the um, flyer and the bobbin in place. And I am gonna chat a little bit before we say goodbye about um, the project that I'm gonna work on this. Now, <laughs> how to set up your, yeah, I should totally pull this out, uh, this part of video out and um, Put it up as a how to set up your e-spinner. What not to do. <laughs> you guys are so good. You're so gracious to me. So um, the project that I'm going to start working on, I talked about it a lot yesterday on the wool stream. Um, we got very distracted yesterday on the wool stream because we were talking about some other stuff that is um, uh, stuff that I'm very, I feel very passionate about as well. And so, um, there we go. Um, if you're struggling with putting your flyer in place, just so that you know, there on the top there is that line and that's where the flyer pops in and out. So if you can't get it to go in, um, you need to match up that to the flat part of the flyer. So you see that flat bit, so the rest of it is round. 
and you see how there's that dig out so you match it up to that there and it pops in like that so then what I'm gonna do I'll move this back so you guys can really see it you're gonna set this up so that this is going to connect on either side you don't want to make this part too long because if you make it too long when you cinch it down this will interfere with this here so you want it to be free floating in the middle here and this side you can sort of tighten it up to ensure that that's the case so what I do, what I did last time, and I'll do it again this time because it worked really well because I did change out my brake band quite a few times on my old one just to figure out what I liked. Um, I leave it through there, sort of ready and set up to, to be knotted off. And then in the meantime, I'm going to set up the wax. The wax thread. which is a little bit difficult to do because there is some wood in the way from, from when they stuck, when they drilled the hole through. So I'm just gonna get rid of that. And then you're gonna thread it through like that. And the way that I like to do it is actually by, um, they are really solid. They're not, um, they're not heavy, these e-spinners, um, but they're not, they're not super light. Um, you know, they're very, very solid. The base of them is very solid. And um, they're, you know, so it goes like that. So that you're looping it through the one side and tying it off. And I will trim that tail when I'm done, but um, I'm going to set it up first. So we'll turn this so you guys can see what I'm doing. So this is actually going to go through here. So it's going to go through the back there. I do need to turn this so that I can do this. So I'm sorry to obstruct your view for just a sec, but I'll show you what I what I've done. I find the wax thread, it works really well. Um, but I find it like, it feels like you're getting this like substance on your fingers. Um, Cause you're getting the wax on your fingers. And I find it's very um, odd feeling. Does that make sense? So that is how it ends up looking. So you've got excess around the back there of the tension knob because you don't want to have it at the end of its rope, literally, because then you have nothing to adjust to, right? So then you set the middle of this of the spring there. And I'll 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 trim these ends once I sort of have this set up the way that I want it set up. And then that will leave me. with the uh, resulting yarn to be able to tie this excess thread down here. These definitely take a little bit of finesse to set up for sure. Um, I don't think I have that right where I want it. It's a little bit long. Um, I want it to be more like we will get this thing up and running in just a sec I promise. Just watch, we'll go to all this effort and then we'll plug it in and it won't work. Ah, shoot, sorry guys, it's like, not coming apart. There we go. 
Oh, scissors, very useful indeed. Okay, one more time, let's try that again. There we go. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll run this up here and then I'll move it onto my trolley later. Um, to plug in, it's very simple. Um, it's only a two prong, which is really nice because it goes into a standard wall socket. Um, and I just need to reach down actually and plug mine in. I'll pull out my, e my other e spinner. used um, my nano very much other than for um, other than for um, sampling um, I just find that I just I just don't think about it um, it's not sort of on my purview particularly to use it um, yeah nice to see you fiddle makes us all feel human oh I'm glad about that it's not, uh, okay, so these go in the back here. There's the input, and then there's the foot, the foot switch that goes here. 12 volt. <clears throat> and then on the front, to operate these things, very, very simple. This is your speed. Um, and when I'm doing my sampling, I often will write like that I have my speed set to two o'clock or I have my speed set to 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock. Um, I find that that's a, a useful thing um, to be able to sort of re recreate later what it was that I was spinning at. It's almost like your speed becomes your ratios, if that makes sense. And then you've got your on and off here. So when the red light is flashing then you know that it's on and then your Z spin and ply S. So spin direction is Z or plying S. So the only reason why they put ply and spin is because the majority of people spin, you know, spin their single Z and ply S, but really it's to help you to differentiate which direction it is that you're spinning. Again, this is one of those situations where you need to know if you're spinning S or spinning Z. So let's see if we can get this thing on. Okay, outlet issues, one sec. So this is spinning in that direction. So it's spinning Z right now. I turned it on, um, but because the foot pedal, the, the hand switch here is plugged in, it was flashing red instead of being solid. So when it's solid, that means that it's running. But if it's on, but it's not spinning, it'll flash because it means it's plugged in, it's on, but you've got the foot pedal plugged in or the hand pedal, paddle, whatever you want to call it. And then when you hit it again, it'll start going again. It's really quiet. And it's not loud at all. So let's speed it up. It's a good little, that's it, one o'clock speed. It's got a nice little hum to it. This is 11 o'clock. And that's 10 o'clock. So that's not too bad, hey? 
I am making it harder on myself because of the camera angle. You're absolutely right, Becca. Yeah, it is true. Thank you for that. <laughs> I feel like that's giving me a bit of grace. <laughs> so there you go. You don't have to use the pedal. I could turn this off and I'll, I'll just switch it off and I'll take the pedal out. Um, the reason why I like the pedal is because when you turn it on, it starts right away. Whereas if you um, turn it off, and then what I find helpful is you can slow it right down and then slowly speed it up when you're ready to go. So if I was trying to minimize bits and pieces and I didn't want to take all the things with me to like say knit night, I would maybe leave the, the, the hand, the, this at home. Um, not that I have a knit night to go to, but if I did, but the nice thing about having this in is when it's turned on, you can turn it on, sit back, get your fiber ready, be ready to spin. And then I often will hit it with my elbow and then I can start going. So it's just, um, I know with the Hanson, if you use the pad, the, the uh, paddle, it'll slowly increase the speed and then it'll slowly decrease the speed when you turn it on and off. Um, this is pretty, like it starts pretty quickly. It's kind of on, um, but that's okay. You don't have to use it. Um, I was holding my breath there. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> I feel like I had lots of people saying a prayer. I feel like this thing is like destined to work because there's so many people jonesing for it. It's very quiet. Um, it, I don't think it, there's any paperwork that says um, what the RPMs are at different speeds. I think, unfortunately, um, you kind of have to figure that out yourself. Um, you know, that if you're spinning. So one of the things that I found really helpful when I had one of these before is, and I found this with my Hanson as well, is when I was spinning and I would write down like single spun at 11 o'clock, short backward draw, I would always in the back of my mind keep, keep, in, keep in mind that when I'm writing that, I'm, I'm default spinning. So my short backward tends to go like this. And I'm, I'm with, if I didn't write anything down, the, it was implied in my notes to myself that I was spinning at sort of a def in a, in a default way. And by changing the speed, I was changing the amount of twist that was going in and out of it, um, in and out of my, my yarn. And I found um, that quite a number of times I thought that my yarns were going to be quite a bit higher twist than they actually were. Um, and that, you know, you think you're spinning so quickly and you're putting all this twist in, but when you're not using your feet and you're not sort of changing the treadling based on what you're feeling in your hands because the machine is just working, right? Um, sometimes you think you're putting in all this twist and you're not. Um, so often I found that I had to work a lot faster um, than I actually had initially thought. So that is something that um, to keep in mind. So is the mic close to it? Yep, yeah, it's right here. Here, I'll, I'll put it even closer. So sorry for a little bit of noise. That's the noise. I'll turn it up, okay? Yeah, and the mic is right here and I'm talking over it. Yeah, pretty cool, hey? So at the um, Sweet Georgia Christmas party, uh, Dan was talking about, you know, Felicia's and that she had one and he knew that I had had one in the past and he's like, everybody says that they're silent, but they're not. Like, we're watching TV and I can hear it. <laughs> and we were laughing about it because Mike was nodding because he's like, yep, totally. But I think that is a misnomer. These things can't be absolutely silent. There is a motor. They are turning. There's quite a bit of cool air coming off of it right now. Like it's actually like blowing at me. I do have the fan on overhead to keep it cool in here because this room gets so hot when I'm podcasting. But that is something to think about. These do have a certain hum to them and they do have a certain noise. So, yeah. More like spindle spinning in that way. Absolutely, uh, Megan, for sure probably can check regularly that yeah so what I found myself doing a lot and one of the reasons why I like the paddle is you can stop pull off the bobbin and check your ply back test and then keep on going and keep on spinning and I found myself especially when I was first getting used to spinning on a knee spinner particularly with my Hanson um, and then again when I had um, a knee spinner before I was constantly doing that to see sort of where I was at and more often than not I had to increase my speed so yeah Yeah, true, uh, 
um, Becca. Um, the one thing that I was going to say um, about this is I do have a really big project that I'm going to be putting on this wheel um, now that I've got it set up and I've, I've done this episode with you guys. Um, I have this really big project. Katrina is actually dying up a little bit more fiber for me. I ordered it from her uh, earlier this week. I have a couple of braids of hers from my stash. I talked about this at, uh, quite a bit actually on the podcast last um, yesterday, the wool stream for those who subscribe but maybe haven't caught that episode yet. It was episode 10. Uh, I have two more braids of this uh, fiber from her Targi uh, coming. I've got Arctic Berries for those who are familiar with that colorway and then Pacific Blue which is a semi-solid of this blue color in here and it's a really big spin that's going to be going on my wheel this one in particular over the next couple of months and I think this is going to be my zero to hero project for the for the sort of the next number of months so I'm excited to chat about that with you guys and to talk about color management and what I'm doing with those braids of fiber for the next few months and then um, we'll put that all together and I'll write it up in an article for Ashford for their Wheeler magazine which is really exciting so I um, thank you you guys for kind of working through that with me and for um, over the next number of months, your enthusiasm about the project, because I'm excited to see it come together. I'm torn between weaving with the yarn and knitting with the yarn, because it'll be four uh, skeins worth of yarn when it's all said and done. And um, I'm kind of excited to sort of work through that with you guys and get your, your help on deciding which I should do. All right, I think that is everything um, for today. We've obviously gone way over time. And, uh, oh, that's awesome. Uh, Rebecca, we totally fiber twinsies. She's doing uh, Arctic Berries on Targi right now as well, which was actually a colorway based on her photo that she had submitted of the Arctic Tundra. So that's very cool. All right, until next time, everyone, happy spinning. Thank you for sticking with me through setting this thing up because it took a little bit longer than I thought that it would. But I appreciate your patience and I appreciate your enthusiasm. So thank you so much. Um, go take a nap, Suzanne. It's so good to see you guys and to chat and... Once again, happy spinning, happy weaving, happy knitting, happy all the things. Have a wonderful weekend, and I will talk to you next week. Bye, guys.